I'm thinking a lot these days about how place, the place where we live and work, influences the kind of art and, and culture that we produce. Um, sometimes it seems to me that in contemporary art we're encouraged to think of art as a kind of extremely autonomous practice that follows its own internal logic. Uh, and we're not very used, I think, to think about how place um, does kind of even unconsciously influence uh, the work that we make and the culture that, that, that we create with, with each other. <clears throat> and so th this relationship to place is something that I've been thinking about. And place also, the way I see it, necessitates that we think about um, power that we think about the relationships of power between different places, some of which are, are um, understood to count as centers and some of which are understood to count as peripheries. And so what's the relationship, uh, whether we believe that we live and work in a center or in a periphery, how do those ideas also influence the kind of art that we produce and the culture that we make? So, so the talk that I'll, I'll present is kind of in two parts. Uh, the first part, I'll, I'll give a very quick and broad overview of um, recent exhibitions and how they have um, presented the relationship between place and, and culture. Um, and I go and, and I, I try to outline some kind of debates that are happening between exhibitions about the role of, of place and culture. <clears throat> And the second part of, my of, of the talk, I'll, I'll mention a few artists and, and I'll show you their work. Um, artists who have helped me think about these, these ideas. Um, so I hope you'll find that uh, to be of interest. Um, so I'll just read. Um, Modern art, and by inheritance, that nebulous thing that we call contemporary art, prioritizes the relationship between urban life and artistic production. Modern art is not simply the art that happens to be made in cities, but is specifically that form of artistic expression that thematizes the changes and transformations of life in these cities. Uh, this is a portrait uh, painted by the French artist Gustave Courbet which depicts the poet Charles Baudelaire at the middle of the 19th century. We can see that Baudelaire, the, the writer, is also present in, Cour in Courbet's famous painting, The Artist's Studio, a real allegory of a seven-year phase in my artistic and moral life, which he painted in 19, uh, 1855. And you can see that Baudelaire appears on the far right um, of the painting and he's sitting reading inside a painter's studio that's populated by some recognizable figures such as Jean Fleury uh, who's a French art critic and prominent supporter of Courbet and the philosopher and anarchist politician Proudhon uh, along with an assorted grouping of anonymous people uh, a group that Linda Nochlin described as including a rabbinical figure, a clown, a beggar woman, a ragged child, a naked model, and in the center, the artist himself. As Courbet himself wrote, the painting depicts uh, what he calls his friends, fellow workers, and art lovers, as well as what he called the world of commonplace life. That is to say, it depicts his social milieu, what we might call today his social network, as well as the anonymous characters that he found in the city where he lived and worked. And Courbet presents these two groups of people as active forces in his artistic and moral formation. Eight years after this painting was finished, Baudelaire ca characterized famously uh, the modern artist as being the painter of modern life. So that's become a kind of uh, important definition of, of um, the modern artist as the painter of modern life. In this way, he emphasized the modern artist's unique and defining ability to capture the frequently fleeting and ever-changing qualities of life within the urban metropolis. Life in Paris, for example, 
as depicted so memorably in paintings like uh, Manet's Rue Monnier with flags, or Cabot's uh, Man on a Balcony, which are both depictions of the world of commonplace life in the city that so interested Courbet uh, two decades earlier, two decades before this painting was painted. Since that time in the late 19th century, the relationship between modern art and its urban context has been explored from the perspective of influential artistic capitals like Paris and later on New York. When the Centre Pompidou opened its doors in 1977, its founding director, Pontus Hulten, inaugurated the new museum with a series of four large-scale exhibitions. Utilizing the resources of the institutions that were housed within the Pompidou, uh, that is the French National Museum of Modern Art, a center for design and architecture, an institute for music and acoustic research, as well as a library. Uh, these four exhibitions drew from various disciplines to explore the history of modern art uh, through the links between Paris and various artistic capitals in Europe and in North America. The first of these exhibitions was Paris, New York, 1908 to 1968. And it was followed by Paris, Berlin, Connections and Contrasts, France, Germany, 1900 to 1933 which was followed in turn by Paris, Moscow, 1900 to 1930, and ended in Paris, Paris, Creations in France, 1937 to 1957. This groundbreaking series of exhibitions prioritized the role that major urban centers have played throughout the 20th century in defining what we understand as modern art. In light of the Pompidou's proposal, we can now say that the modern artist has, in effect, turned out to be the artist who paints life in cities like Moscow, Berlin, and New York, and who does so in direct relationship uh, to the city of Paris, which is understood as a kind of nexus uh, that originates and defines for the rest of us what counts as modern. <clears throat> Undeniably, this series of exhibitions was an ambitious feat of scholarship. In order to go deeper and try to understand its significance, however, I think it's important to consider the timing of the exhibition, of these exhibitions, at this precise moment of Cold War cultural politics. In 1948, at the start of the Cold War, the most influential art critic in the United States, Clement Greenberg, wrote a text titled The Decline of Cubism. Uh, and this, it was published in a publication called Partisan Review in 1948. Uh, and this is the cover of that publication. Uh, in this essay, he stated that the main premises of Western art have at last migrated to the United States, along with the center of gravity of industrial power and political power. Greenberg's text was the first serious attempt to challenge the supremacy of Paris and to argue for the role that the city of New York would henceforth play in replacing Paris as the new artistic capital for Western culture. From this perspective, we can consider the four inaugural exhibitions at the Centre Pompidou in the late 1970s as an energetic yet somewhat belated response to that moment in the 1940s when, to quote Serge Gibault, New York stole the idea of modern art. I live in Toronto. Uh, this is what a Google image search tells us Toronto looks like from an airplane. Uh, and this is the neighborhood where my brother Giancarlo lives, near Bloor Street West and Dufferin. And here's Dufferin Grove Park, where his sons Maxie and Luca go to play in the summertime. Uh, and here is Dufferin approaching Dundas Street West. Uh, and this is College Street at Dover Court, uh, west of Little Italy. The struggle for cultural hegemony 
between Paris and New York might be merely a matter of curiosity for us here in Guelph, or in Toronto for that matter. If it were not for the fact that what is at stake in such a struggle is to influence the forms of cultural production that are possible elsewhere. This, after all, is precisely what hegemony means. In 2010, the catalog introducing the new installation of the permanent collection of modern art at the National Museum Reina Sofia in Madrid describes the situation of cultural politics with astonishing clarity. So I'm going to quote from, this, from the introduction of this uh, catalog. <clears throat> Since the Second World War, this hegemonic account has been at one with a highly specific ideology orchestrated by the Anglo-American world to suit the post-war period's discourse of, co of political and cultural domination. A single line of investigation was established, starting in Paris and ending in New York. Furthermore, Everything that occurred on the periphery of these urban nuclei was defined as derivative or secondary. Any element that might challenge the continuity of this interpretation or reveal the unsolvable singularity and differences of events was jettisoned or forgotten. A product of its time, the collection of the Museo Reina Sofia largely took shape within the, the parameters of a fluid succession of avant-garde isms, such that native contributions, that is to say, artistic production in Spain itself, appeared as local echoes. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this idea of local echoes, that if, if you don't happen to live in what's defined as the capital, by definition what you do is merely an echo of of something that is actually more authentic or more, um, more legitimate. Artists working anywhere in the world outside of the axis of art capitals, uh, who as modern artists are dedicated to depict their own experiences in the places where they live and work, are doomed to be understood not in their own terms, but simply as local echoes or der derivations of utterances that are emitted elsewhere, in cities deemed to be more original, more interesting, and dare I say, more real than the locales where their own work takes place. Uh, the artist Mladen Stilinovic produced a work titled An Artist Who Cannot Speak English Is No Artist. Uh, this is a work from 1992. And I find it amazing because it describes in, I think, the most succinct manner possible the effect that the Anglo-American cultural hegemony that was described in the Reina Sofia catalog produces on an artist like himself who is based on, in Zagreb. So I wonder, how is such hegemony experienced in a city like Toronto? A story told by Barry Lord, author of The History of Painting in Canada Towards a People's Art, uh, this was published in 1974, is instructive. He writes about the group of abstract painters called the Painters Eleven, which banded together in Toronto in 1954. Lord prefaced his story about the Painters Eleven with a, with a quick overview of relations between Canada and the United States at the time of the group's formation. And he writes, the distant early warning line of radar stations was being erected across our Northland to defend the United States. US profits were rolling down roads to resources paid for by Canadians. Oil and natural gas followed our ore and forest products south. Especially in Toronto, the compradors prospered. And here I'll parenthetically um, uh, tell you what Lord means, means by compradors. Uh, he tells us that the Portu Portuguese word comprador, meaning buyer, was first used for the Chinese manager or senior, senior employee in Portugal's commercial establishments in China. And has now come to mean 
uh, to refer generally to that class of people in a colony who buy status and profit for themselves by helping the imperial power to exploit their fellow colonials. So it's, it's the people in a colony who are able to buy prestige and profit for themselves by facilitating imperial powers um, to exploit their fellow colonials. And so Lord continues, they, the Compradors of Toronto, and their intellectual servants form the beginnings of a new patron class with a complacent belief in North American civilization and the superiority of almost anything from the United States. And I think that, the, the, I find this uh, Barry Lord's book quite astonishing because in, in all of my research, I've never heard anyone try to look at culture, or painting for that matter, from this perspective. And once you start to kind of think in this way, you start to see, it starts to, I think, at least to my mind, explain a lot of phenomena that might have happened in the 50s, but I think still happens to us today in a kind of culture, um, cultural infrastructure and, and patronage that we find today. So having outlined this quasi-colonial economic and political relationship between the US and Canada, Lord gives us a short anecdote of how the Painters 11 were affected culturally by these broader relationships of subservience. And I'm gonna give a lengthy quote. Uh, so he writes, in 1955, William Ronald, uh, who's one of the painters of the group, moved from Toronto to New York where he was at first enormously successful. In 1956, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. And by April of that year, he had already interested the executive of the American Abstract Artist Group enough that they invited Painters 11 to show in their annual exhibition in New York's Riverdale Museum. The colonials from Toronto were well displayed and generously reviewed. They were a hit. By April of 1957, Ronald was enjoying his first solo exhibition in New York. He had signed a contract to produce 18 major paintings a year for exhibition and sale with the Coots Gallery, one of the leading commercial galleries in Manhattan at that time. Ronald's first exhibition, opening in 1957, was a great triumph for his old teacher, Jock MacDonald, another artist of Painters 11. Some friends gave McDonald the money to fly down for the event, where he met leading New York painters and the critic Clement Greenberg. This agent for US painting proposed that the Painters 11 invite him to Toronto to tell them how well they measured up. Even though he, Clement Greenberg, made more money from one lecture or article than most of the Painters 11 had earned from their sales in the entire last year, Greenberg suggested that his trip should be at their expense. Two artists from the group, Harold Town and Walter Yarwood, uh, this is a painting by Harold Town, refused to pay the tribute money. Town's attitude was not entirely due to patriotic zeal, Lord writes. He was just as committed to US abstract expressionism as Ronald was, but he wanted to develop his own colonial version of it in Toronto. So finally, in 1957, Greenberg made his historic trip to Toronto, restricting himself to the artists who had paid up. So he only visited the studios of those who had paid. Uh, McDonald's letter, uh, so um, Jock McDonald's letter, so this is Jock McDonald. Uh, he wrote a letter to a friend in Calgary relating the visit and, and this letter reveals what Barry Lord called the cringing colonial to be found within this gifted artist and teacher. And this is a quote from that letter. At long last, I am really on the road, so says Clement Greenberg. He told me that my new work was a tremendous step forward in the right direction, completely my own, and would stand up with anything in New York. As late as 1970, when the book Canadian Art Today was published, Harold Town wrote that Torontonians, and I think by extension even Canadians, are constantly being told that art isn't made here, it's always from somewhere else. 
So this, I think, describes the kind of cultural effects that kind of political or economic um, colonial relationships produce. Uh, this kind of sense that uh, you need to measure up to someone who's deemed to be more, more real than you. That you can't really be a real artist on your own, you know, uh, unless it gets the stamp of approval from someone from the capital. The Tate Modern opened its doors in London in May 2000. Its first major exhibition was Century City, Art and Culture in the Mo Modern Metropolis, organized by Ivona Blazwick. Like Houlton's project in Paris 20 years previously, the exhibition in London explored the relationship between cultural production and the metropolis. And agreeing with Baudelaire, Blaswick described the city as the medium for the modern. So even like more than a hundred years later, there's still this, this powerful relationship between urban experience and art uh, as being characteristic of modern art. <clears throat> but in contrast to the Pompidou's proposal, however, Century City focused on nine cities from around the world, beyond the nar narrow parameters of Europe and North America. Each of these cities was explored at a specific moment over the pre previous hundred years. Bombay, Mumbai in the 1990s, Lagos in the 1950s and 60s, London in the 1990s, Moscow in the 1920s, New York in the 70s, Paris at the beginning of the century, Rio de Janeiro during the 1950s and 60s, Tokyo in the 70s, and Vienna at around 1910. This expanded perspective provided a less Western and more truly global view of modern culture. And here are two images showing the Bombay Mumbai section of the exhibition, uh, which was co-curated by Gita Kapoor and Ashish Rajadyaksha. While each of the nine urban case studies that were featured in the exhibition had demonstrably generated a distinct artistic culture, they were also presented in the exhibition as being emblematic of wider so, uh, global tendencies. This new contextualization of modern art not only expanded the field of reference beyond Europe and North America to include South American, African, and Asian cities, this new context also redefined the status of the Western capitals themselves. As Blaswick wrote in her curatorial essay, long before the radiating lines of airline companies crisscrossing the world, artists and intellectuals had tracked the trade routes of ideas around the globe. These routes had hubs. Cities like Barcelona, Paris, and London were stopping off points for artists from Moscow to Japan, Nicaragua to Nigeria. Perhaps the Western metropolis should not be understood as a point of origin in the genesis of modernism, so much as a site for cross-pollination in a reciprocal process of global exchange. Artists arrive from around the world, bringing with them their own versions of the modern, which were to undergo a process of exchange and hybridization to be further enriched as artists continued their circuits or returned to their own cities. Uh, this is the neighborhood where, where my, my mother Zuli lives with her husband Jim in Scarborough. Uh, and here's a strip mall on Midland Avenue. Uh, and here's one of the many Chinese malls that you find in Toronto suburbs. Uh, and I should say Scarborough is home to more than 600,000 people and is thus comparable in population size to a city such as Stuttgart or Genoa. As I hope to have outlined here, the Century City exhibition was part of a debate in the West about the precise place of the modern from Baudelaire in the 19th century and his prioritizing of the city as the place where the modern artist belongs, 
to the struggles for cultural hegemony between New York uh, in the between New York in the 1940s and Paris at the end of the 1970s. And closer to today, uh, to attempts in Madrid and London to question the hegemonic framework that organizes the world as peripheries subserviently wishing to emulate Western artistic capitals. Just as a little bit of an aside, uh, I'd like to mention a rather surprising Canadian contribution, contribution to this debate. Uh, that appeared in the form of an exhibition presented at the National Gallery of Canada in 1973. Uh, organized by Bryden Smith and Pierre Teberge, the exhibition Boucherville, Montreal, Toronto, London featured six artists who lived and worked in four cities, large and small, located in central Canada. Straddling the provinces of Quebec and Ontario, the four locales, uh, Boucherville, Montreal, Toronto and London, are part of an important region called the Quebec City Windsor Corridor, which is the most densely populated and heavily industrialized area of the country. This region is contested territory, as I think we might know, uh, since due to their large populations, the provinces of Quebec and Ontario have traditionally held a significant amount of political power in Canada, which leads to some resentment or some amount of resentment from other provinces in the country. As representatives of the National Gallery, the curators of the exhibition consciously tread into tricky waters when they pointedly ask, does the fact that the organizers of this exhibition, as well as the six artists, live and work in central Canada, possibly reflect, if not a certain prejudice, then at least a ready acceptance of familiar cultural patterns? And cheekily they answer, perhaps it does. But they continue, Yet one of the organizers was born and raised in Eastern Quebec, near the New Brunswick border. Two of the artists were born outside of Canada, one in England and one in France. A third artist moved to central Canada from Nova Scotia at the age of 22. So I think their words kind of uh, resonate with those of Ivona Blaswick a quarter of a century later, uh, when she understood that cities are not so much points of origin of uh, modernism, but rather they are sites of cross-pollination and exchange that create the modern. So to sum up this part of the talk, um, uh, I'd like to just highlight that the Western modernism raised the question of the relationship between urban life and modern art. But what I'd call a postmodern response to this question attempts to argue two main points. That the model of singular hegemonic artistic capitals, whether they be Paris or New York, it kind of doesn't matter where the hegemony lies, but that this model cannot account for a globalized experience of multiple centers among fields of cultural power far beyond the West. And that this new model of multiple centers which may include non-Western artistic capitals like Lagos or Rio de Janeiro, as much as it may include Western non-capitals like London, Ontario and Boucherville, Quebec. This new globalized modern redefines the hegemonic capitals more as important sites for cross-pollination and less as points of origin of what counts as modern. And so at this point, I'd just like to give a quick overview of six artists who have influenced my thinking um, about these questions of place and the relationship of place to artistic production. Um, first, I'd like to, to mention the work of Greg Curnow, uh, a well-known artist from London, Ontario. Uh, he did this amazing work uh, in 1987 uh, what if daily life in Canada is boring? And what if I'm not aware of what is interesting to others about my life? There's something about, there's a kind of sense of audacity that I love about this piece. You know, kind of, if um, working as an artist in Canada, you're supposed to kind of feel a sense of inferiority in relationship to other more glamorous places. Um, 
you're never supposed to make an artwork about that inferiority, <laughs> you know? But to do so, I think, shows that you freed your mind from this sense of, of being less than, or being derivative, or being, let's say, um, in the wrong place, you know? What if daily life in Canada is boring? I don't care. I work here, I live here, and I have my community here. You know, so I think, I think that there, this piece and signals um, a, a, a mental leap uh, from a kind of culture that you've been given to try to imagine a different form, a different relationship. And I'll show you a couple of uh, earlier works from the 60s that he made. Uh, this is a painting titled Left Front Window, 1st of April, 1967. Uh, which, using these kind of printer's blocks, so these letter blocks, he's just printing a text which is a description of what he sees out of his left front window on April 1st, 1967. Uh, the right front corner of Nova, Novak's roof, it's a brick building painted yellow on the front, faded and painted on this side, a two foot high false front with a rounded rise on the corner, a stylized wood flower ornament, semicircular on its face, and, and the text goes on. So it's a, it's a really precise, almost ridiculously precise, in a way it's so precise, if you weren't there at the, that time, you'd be like, okay, who cares? Um, but there's something quite resonant and, and profoundly, I think, modern in a very classical sense. Uh, in a way, this is exactly a painting like Kay Bott's painting you know, of, of uh, a century earlier this idea of what does life look like just outside my window? Like, as soon as I open my eyes or I open the blinds, what do I see, right? Uh, and here there's another work of Greg Kernow uh, titled List of Names of Boys I Grew Up With from 1962. And it's literally a list of names of boys that he can remember having grown, in, grown up with. Uh, the last piece of his that I'd like to show you is this uh, book titled Deeds Abstracts that was written in 1991-92 and published in 1995. And this book, it's almost, um, it's kind of a biography, not of a person, but of a place. Uh, the book traces the ownership of the land on which his house and studio at 38 Western Street in London, Ontario stands. So, so a, a history of this very important to him piece of land, but maybe very unimportant to anyone else piece of land, right? And so, so in a way it engages the difference between being in a place and having your life and your work there and your family and, and your artistic practice. And what's the relationship to someone who doesn't have that relationship to that specific place? Uh, in 1982, he said, I have strong feelings about where I was born, about living in a relatively small city, slightly over 260 kilometers away from a large one. He's talking about Toronto. And about living in a sparsely populated large country beside a heavily populated large country. And he said in, in the introduction to this book, the question, um, he, 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 he talks about the power of two kinds of histories. The histories of broad conclusions and great events in contrast to what he calls histories of detail. Um, and he says, I, I feel the power of many details adding up to under, understanding of the ground that I'm standing on. So, so the work of Greg Kernow for me is really kind of something that really brings uh, to my mind the importance of thinking about um, place very specifically and without the kind of inherited hang-ups of, you know, is it good enough? Is it interesting? Is it, it's, it's not as glamorous as, let's say, Paris or Berlin or New York or whatever you want. Uh, I'll, I'll mention the work of another artist. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an artwork by Robert Houle. <clears throat> um, he wrote a short text titled The Place of Memory and Storytelling in 1993. And I'll give a little quote. Growing up on the reserve, 
meant speaking and hearing only Soto Anishinaabe until I attended school. Later, I was to discover that there are langu language groups other than my own. English, the language of the classroom. Sioux and Cree, the languages of my classmates. And finally, French, the language spoken by the nuns and priests. The realization that the sounds of other languages designate one or another object, bread, meat, sky, demons, trees, flowers, name other objects or designate nothing at all and are simple noise. This realization was an awesome experience. And what an incredible um, description of, of the encounter between kind of one life system of meaning and significance, culture, when it meets another uh, and recognizing that your cultural references of meaning that inform your life and your worldview might count as noise to someone who doesn't share that worldview, just like your worldview might count as noise. I don't understand it, it's in incomprehensible to me. You know, and so, so he's very, as an artist, he's very conscious about this question of, um, of different uh, points of view uh, meeting each other. Uh, this is one of a series of five works that he produced, uh, collectively titled Premises for Self-Rule, which he made in 1994. And it's an interesting series of work because it, even it, the work itself mashes together different languages. So here we see like, you know, classic, modern, abstract painting mixed with documentary photography and mixed with language, in this case, legal language. And I'll quickly talk about four of, of out of the five uh, paintings or works from this series, Premises for Self-Rule. Uh, this first one is, uh, is Premises for Self-Rule, the, the Royal Proclamation, 1763. And the Royal Proclamation was issued by King George III to officially claim British territory in North America after Britain won the Seven Years' War. In this Royal Proclamation, ownership over North America was issued to King George. However, the Royal Proclamation explicitly states that Aboriginal title has existed and continues to exist, and that all land would be considered Aboriginal land until it's ceded by treaty. The proclamation forbade settlers from claiming land from the, Aboriginal, the original occupants, unless it has first been bought by the Crown and then sold to the settlers. And the, the Royal Proclamation further states that only the Crown can buy land from First Nations. Uh, this is the second work from the series. It's titled Premises for Self-Rule, the British North America Act, 1867. And we might know uh, Canada dates its history as a country to the British North America Act, which came into effect on July 1st, 1867. However, Canada was not established as a fully independent um, country since the United Kingdom retained legislative control over Canada and full control over its foreign policy. Uh, this is the fourth work from the series, Premises for Self-Rule, the Indian Act, 1876. And the Indian Act is a Canadian federal law that governs in matters pertaining to Indian status, bans and, and uh, Indian reserves. And throughout its history, it's been highly invasive and paternalistic, as it authorizes the Canadian federal government to regulate and administer in the affairs and day-to-day -day lives of registered Indians and reserved communities. And this authority has ranged from overarching political control, such as imposing governing structures on Aboriginal communities in the form of band councils, to control over the rights um, of land uh, to, of Native people, um, and, and uh, the ability for Native people to practice their culture and their traditions. 
Uh, and the last work from this series is titled Premises for Self-Rule, the Constitution Act, 1982. The Canadian government did not initially plan to include Aboriginal rights so extensively within the Constitution when the Constitution Act was being drafted in the early 1980s. Early drafts and discussions during the patriation of the Canadian Constitution did not include any recognition of those existing Aboriginal rights and relationships. But through campaigns and demonstrations, Aboriginal groups in Canada successfully fought to have their rights enshrined and pr protected. Section 35 of the, of the Constitution Act recognizes and affirms existing Aboriginal rights, but it does not define what those rights are. The definition of Aboriginal rights has been the topic of much debate and discussion, and they have been defined over time through Supreme Court cases, which is why today like, so the Supreme Court decisions about Native rights is so important because of what has been written down in 1982 in this document. <clears throat> um, Aboriginal rights have been interpreted to include a range of cultural, social, political and economic rights that include the right to land, as well as the right to fish, to hunt, and to practice one's own culture, and also to establish treaties. What I find amazing about this series of works is that it's, you know, if Greg Curnow's book, Deed Abstracts, was a kind of biography, but not of a person, but of a place, I think of this body of work uh, by Robert Houle as a kind of panorama. But you know, sometimes, most of the time, we think of a panorama of a landscape. And it is a panorama of a landscape, of this land we call Canada. But in the way I've described it, this panorama is defined by, by, by legal documents. You know, and, and what's interesting, or the way he chose to depict this landscape, is not so much on its kind of geography, but of, of the legal relationships that have been happening over, over really a couple of hundred years that shape uh, everyday life and culture here. Um, the other artist I'd like to share, whose work I'd like to share with you, uh, is Susie Lake. Uh, and she made this piece titled, Are You Talking To Me? in 1979. Uh, Are You Talking To Me? is an installation of 83 self-portraits of the artist in the midst of an emotional dialogue, um, actually a monologue. Uh, this is a close-up, and uh, if people are intrigued by Susie Lake's work, there's a major show of her work right now at the AGO in Toronto, so you can see this full installation as well as uh, the rest of her uh, quite incredible practice. Um, if you notice, like, each of the photographs uh, has been manipulated with uh, s some color highlights uh, and also physical manipulation of the negatives you know, some of the images you see that the negative has been kind of heated and stretched. Uh, and all of these manipulations um, create a focus around the mouth. And this focus reminds us of Robert De Niro's character uh, uh, in the movie Taxi Driver, when he's talking to himself in the mirror and saying, are you talking to me? Uh, I don't know if everybody has seen this movie, uh, but it's, it's a film by Martin Scorsese uh, that tells the story of Travis Bickle, uh, an honorably discharged U.S. Marine who lives as a lonely and depressed man in New York and who transforms himself as a vigilante, disgusted by the street crime and prostitution that he witnesses throughout the city. Um, there's a kind of interesting, I think, biographical connection to Susie Lake, who moved to Canada, first to Montreal and then to Toronto, uh, as a, in protest of uh, the, the US uh, war in Vietnam. Uh, so her and her then partner uh, left the country, and she's remained here ever since. So there's this kind of interesting relationship between the character in the film and herself, you know, about this idea of the residues of, of um, the military experience in the U.S. But from my perspective, I also see another kind of level of interest, and that's the condition of the artist in a colonial culture, where I think 
in a colonial culture, you can't quite assume either that you know who your audience is or that you even have an audience. So the, the artist kind of acting like an actor who is talking to himself in the mirror, asking, are you talking to me, to her own <laughs> reflection, is I think a really interesting description, poetical description, of the life of an artist in a colonial culture where there's a kind of unreality to uh, our culture and our audience and our relationships with one another. Uh, here's another artist, uh, Robert Fones, who is originally from London, Ontario, but has lived in Toronto for many years. And there's one work that I wish I could buy, <laughs> like if the National Gallery didn't beat me to it. I would love to live with this piece. It's titled uh, Butter Models, and he made that in 1979. Uh, so it's two kind of vitrines like you find in a, in a deli, in a delicatessen, you know, showing kind of cheeses or meats or whatever. Uh, in this case, it displays different uh, oh. representations of different butters. So what he's done is he's gone around southern Ontario to different dairies uh, and he's, he's bought kind of a package of like a pound of butter from these different places. And to make the piece, he, he washed the label and made a block of wood the size of the butter uh, and rewrapped it, you know, otherwise it would just kind of rot in the gallery, which is no, no good. That's not what he wanted to happen. Uh, but in a way, you, we can see this as a kind of artist museum, as a mini museum made by an artist uh, displaying artifacts of culture, right? Uh, in this case, uh, the distinct, distinctive forms of culture that's produced uh, in southern Ontario, not necessarily by people who think of themselves as artists, but in this case, um, dairy farmers, but people who are nevertheless evidently creating their own forms of culture. And you know, as you read all the different labels, all the different names, all the different ways in which imagery is used to kind of brand or create a different aura for essentially very similar products, butter, uh, really shows you that there's a kind of vernacular culture being produced in these objects that we might kind of not even consider as culture uh, and yet, if we look at them, we actually start to think uh, and, and appreciate the forms of vernacular culture that's around us in an everyday way. Just as an aside, uh, there's a little pamphlet um, that, that I think of in relation to Robert Fone's work. Uh, and it's the review of the Association for the Documentation of Neglected Aspects of Culture in Canada. Um, this was a kind of it sounds like a big deal, <laughs> like a big association. It's actually an extremely kind of homemade uh, group of people that included Greg Curnow and Pierre Teberge, who had done the Boucherville, Quebec, London, Toronto show, uh, where they documented, they actually collected, exhibited, and documented uh, aspects of ne neglected aspects of Canadian culture, like these butters, for example. So they would do exhibitions, for example, of like, um, uh, indie, like a soda pop production in Ontario, right? And they would collect it, research it, exhibit it, document it in these publications. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite moving, I think. Uh, the second last artist, uh, in this case artist group, that I'd like to show you is the work of Samir Farouk and Miriam Lishoten. Uh, and they made this project titled The Museum of Found Objects, Toronto, Maharaja and, uh, and they made this piece, foolishly I didn't write down the year, 2010, thank you very much, <laughs> it pays to have experts. Um, so, so like Robert Fone's work, this is also a kind of mini museum, an artist museum. Um, in this case they called it the Museum of Found Objects. Uh, and it was co-presented by the Art Gallery of Ontario and SAVAC, the South Asian Visual Arts Centre. So Toronto-based artist Samir Farouk and his Paris-France-based collaborator Miriam Lishoten apply the typical functions of a museum. So that's collecting, preparing, interpreting, 
and displaying. But they applied these functions, these museum practices, to a selection of objects collected from the greater Toronto area, and specifically from South Asian neighborhoods in Brampton, Mississauga, Scarborough, and Milton, Ontario. Um, in their words, they, they describe the project like this. The collections of the Museum of Found Objects are not intended to be definitive, but they evoke hidden or unexpected as aspects of a place or city. And their project, they describe the project in explicitly, um, they raise the question of coloniali uh, colonialization very explicitly. Uh, the Museum of, in their words, the Museum of Found Objects ex examines the museological paradigm and the authority with which it represents culture, specifically non-Western cultures that have known a history of colonization. In Toronto, the Museum of Found Objects was presented at the AGO in response to a major blockbuster exhibition that was then concurrently on view. This exhibition was titled Maharaja, The Splendor of Indian's Royal Courts. And the, and the exhibition was co-organized by the AGO and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It examined the history of the Indian subcontinent through some more than 200 objects produced during the, under the patronage of, India, of Indians, India's kings, uh, many of which originated from the collections of the East India Company. And they noticed that the history of the museum as a public institution parallels the colonization of India and has a long history in the subcontinent. The Indian Museum in Kolkata is the ninth oldest museum in the world and was established by the Asiatic Society in Bengal in 1814. So it's very interesting to notice that the rise of museums is almost synchronous with the history of colonization. You know, and, and this is very much a part of, of their, this piece. Other early museums include the Government Museum in Chennai, which was founded in 1851, the Bombay uh, Natural Museum, Natural History Museum of 1883, the Lahore Museum in 1894. And this history is closely associated with a colonial survey of the subcontinent, uh, with many museums in India being a legacy of this colonial history. Uh, presenting the Maharaja exhibition in Canada in turn makes assumptions about Canadian and specifically Indo-Canadian audiences and their relationship to this colonial history. Second generation and diasporic Indians are often estranged from a critical understanding of this history of India. Their relationship to these exhibitions like the Maharaja show at the AGO, like the relationship of many non-South Asian visitors, is largely voyeuristic. The everyday objects that were presented in the Museum of Found Objects provide not only an insight into the consumer tastes and spending habits of South Asian community and the GTA, uh, but describe the unique character, the resourcefulness, adaptability, and syncretism of this community. So at the end of the exhibition, they invited people to uh, take objects with them to kind of take the museum home. And so here you have people like helping themselves to, uh, to the collection. And the last artist work that I'd like to uh, share with you is uh, the work of Jan Poldas, uh, who made this work uh, titled EG Series in 1978. So it's a series of monochromatic uh, paintings uh, painted on, on panels. But what's, you know, it, and it looks like, well, you know, classic minimalism. Um, <clears throat> but, but, but there's something intriguing about this piece um, because he uses local colors from corporate logos and identities. So he's using security yellow after the Metro, Metropolitan Police, red after the Toronto Fire Department, blue after Via Rail, red after Coca-Cola, and blue after the Toronto Star. So, so these colors 
as well as something about the texture of, of the paint in which you usually find these, so like kind of car enamel in the police yellow, for example, or, you know, he, he also tries to not just match the color, but also something about the texture. Um, all derived from, from, from uh, objects that he experiences in the urban landscape in, in Toronto, where he lives and works. Uh, and the artist, Paul Das himself, compares this work uh, to the various professions that were represented by the figures in Gustave Courbet's uh, atelier. So he's very consciously thinking about this. And re you remember Courbet's earlier words about kind of painting his social network, his, his circle of friends and, and fellow artists, but also the group of people that he doesn't know but that he meets in Paris every day, right? A rabbi, a beggar, and so on. Uh, so in a similar way, uh, Jan Poldes is trying to represent something about his experience of the city, represented in this case using the language of abstraction, but yet to try to kind of tap into a kind of um, unconscious experience among members of his audience who share life in the same place that he does. Uh, taken out of their usual context, these corporate colors would appear to other residents in Toronto at that time as strangely familiar, yet unrecognizable. And Robert Fones, uh, remember the artist who did the butter models, uh, talks about this piece and says that, that these, these colors and, and textures uh, become like old friends from elementary school whom one hasn't seen for decades. The colors trigger recognition, yet require re-evaluation at the same time. And with that, I thank you for your attention.